Gene, let's talk about how this is affecting the Middle East and the maybe even more broadly the MENA region. And also this, you know, let's start with the with the top line. I've talked about this before. The U.S. sanctions campaign against Iran has already had an enormously negative humanitarian consequence, even pre-corona. It has been amped up and continued. People like Mon- Mike Pompeo in power, but also uh, sort of you know disgusting pundits like an Eli Lake have seen this as an opportunity. Uh, for regime, uh, for, you know, the never ending quest for war or regime change with Iran. Can you, let's just start, we'll we'll talk more broadly about Turkey and Iraq and all the other dynamics, but what is the state of specifically the sanctions war and the enormous humanitarian toll on Iran and those who see this as an opportunity uh, to push forward a a, a U.S. uh, uh, regime change agenda? Yeah, sure. So, you know, when we look at the impact of Corona on Iran in in a general sense, Iran was a country that was affected very early by Corona, hit pretty hard by Corona. And of course, you know, we can look at the internal dynamics of Iran that have helped exacerbate this. However, if we, you know, take a look at the international uh, situation, we can see, you know, that sanctions on Iran have made things very difficult for the Iranian government, whatever their flaws are, to purchase and acquire the equipment necessary to deal with uh, with this crisis as it gets out of control. Um, so there's a little bit of double talk taking place from the U.S. administration about the sanctions. So they say, well, you know, uh, medical supplies are not under sanctions, you know, Iran can import medical supplies, and they blame the Iranian regime saying, well, you know, they're spending all this money on proxies abroad when they should be spending it uh, at, uh, at home, uh, which is ironic because, you know, that's a criticism we could talk about the United States spending its resources on foreign wars rather than spending it on uh, health care for its population. But the truth is, you know, even if the sanctions are, uh, uh, don't include medical supplies, how are they going to purchase it? If you're a bank and you want to do business with Iran and the Iran wants to transfer money to purchase these goods, this is a risky situation. So there are a whole load of sort of things which are not directly related to the purchase of uh, procurement of medical supplies, which make it difficult for Iran to purchase uh, the th- supplies that they need. So basically what, we're, what we see is, you know, if uh, Iran can't transfer the money it needs, um, business uh, banks and financial institutions that would have to be involved in these purchases don't want to do business with Iran because, you know, it's risky. What if they right. do it and the Americans uh, clamp down on them? So we have this kind of double speak. Uh, or at least that's been going on recently uh, about, uh, you know, about sort of misinformation about what the situation is with sanctions. Yes, formally, Iran can purchase medical supplies, but the mechanisms through which they would purchase it are, are, are held up by these sanctions. Now, there has been sort of in the last couple of days, Pompeo has kind of softened his uh, stance on Iran and you know, stated maybe that they would sort of loosen up some of these restrictions. But that's after enormous pushback, and not just from the usual suspects, you know, people who are critics of uh, American foreign policy, but, you know, Great Britain. Britain is not, uh, you know, is it, not like a hippy-dippy left-wing uh, socialist government, but even they realize that, you know, the, uh, Iran having this healthcare crisis is not going to be particularly helpful for anyone. And, you know, so there's been pushback on this. But of course, we see uh, we see this sort of pathological hostility towards Iran amongst certain elements of the uh, American foreign policy establishment. So you mentioned Lake, you mentioned Pompeo. I mean, we have the sort of United Against a Nuclear Iran, which is an organization sort of run by, or I think chaired by our old friend Joe Lieberman, uh, yep. you know, Ann Coulter's favorite Democrat, which has, you know, as this crisis was expanding, was suggesting that we should increase sanctions on Iran. So, you know, this is not to sort of... Um, uh, this is not to sort of uh, uh, sweep under the carpet the, the 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 actions of the Iranian regime in mismanaging this crisis or the uh, perverse priorities that elements of the Iranian regime have in dealing with this. But 
you know, the United States' stance and posture to this has not been particularly helpful because, as you mentioned at the top, there are a number of people who see this as an opportunity for regime change. Now, I don't see personally how this is going to be an opportunity for regime change. You know, uh, if there is a sort of a disease out, out in the open, uh, you know, people are going to event, you know, aren't really going to want to go out and protest. They aren't really going to go, uh, want to go out against their regime, ha uh, however angry they are. So this seems like sheer vindictiveness. And, you know, of course, there are elements within the Middle East, uh, you know, people who have been on, let's say, the other end of Iranian intervention, people who have been, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, people in Lebanon and Syria who have, uh, being opposed to Iranian uh, intervention, you know they they too sort of participate in this uh, uh, discourse about uh, blaming this entirely on the Iranian regime. Uh, but um, you know, there's no doubt that the American response to this, or at least among some of the uh, conservative establishment, has been deeply disturbing and displays. You know, they can talk about how much they don't uh, have a hostility towards the Iranian people and the Iranian people are fine, uh, but it's the regime they dislike. But the people who are going to suffer from this are the Iranian people. And you know, it's not going to produce any productive re uh, result, even from their own perspective. You know, even Isn't that, then we have to really uh, contextualize the, you know, the Trump administration approach and all sanctions regimes approaches. I mean, this is the idea. Let's make the people of Iran suffer. Let's make the people of Venezuela suffer. Let's make the people of Nicaragua suffer to the point where you can't even, you know, and I, obviously I would draw a distinction, particularly with a place like Venezuela, which uh, has, you know, particularly under Chavez made serious, significant accomplishments in cutting poverty as an example, which has not happened in Iran. Contrary to the discourse of the Iranian revolution, Iran actually has quite high inequality rates. And there is a kind of predatory capital class in Iran, contrary to the sort of ethos and discourse of the Iranian constitution. But you just can't even, it is, it is such a level of, of ruthlessness and relentlessness that you, you start to get to a point where you cannot even have, you just simply can't have an independent conversation of the failures or successes of local governance models because the, the economic onslaught is so, overwhelming. And also, it just seems like what is so difficult for policymakers to figure out, it, it, taking them on their own terms, which I would not necessarily take them on, but just the very basic idea that, uh, you know, and, and look, I, I think this is something that at times the left needs to be more realistic about. It was an absolute disaster that the American people rallied around George W. Bush after September 11th, the disaster we're still living with to today. And ended up costing millions of people their lives. And, you know, I cannot stress how big of a disaster that legacy was. And at the same time, it should not be a shock to anyone that there is some intuitive human response to rally with, you know, people that they perceive on some level to be part of the same group uh, in the face of external threat. So how on earth you would expect even the most virulent opponent of the Iranian government to not say, you are the prime antagonists of us not getting medicine right now, regardless of what I think of any number of social and economic policies. I mean, it's just intuitively obvious. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, and we've discussed this before, when we look at the relationship between the United States and Iran over the last, you know, 40 years, the hardline nationalists have often fed off each other, whether intentional or not intentional, you know, uh, Reagan was able to come uh, come to power in part by sort of taking advantage of the hard line of the Iranian revolution and Iranian, uh, you know, Iranian hardliners uh, have been able to make use of the sort of siege discourse to rally, if not the majority of the Iranian population, but a significant proportion of the re uh, Iranian population around the regime. You know, when it comes to an issue like the nuclear issue, you know, you will find people who are opposed to the, uh, you know, Persians who are opposed to the uh, Iranian regime on a sense of national pride, also wanting Iran to have a nuclear weapon. It's a complicated and uh, nuanced issue. And, you know, by, impo you know, by 
uh, having this antagonistic approach, it, it, it helps solidify the, uh, the position of nationalists. It helps uh, uh, solidify, you know, they feed off each other. You know, this is not, uh, uh, for example, Ahmadinejad came to power uh, partly in response to the United States ramping up of hostility towards Iran following 9-11, despite the fact that the Iranians had had nothing to do with that particular issue, and many of the many of the the, the figures that uh, the United States was pursuing in the so-called war on terrorism were individuals who the Iranian regime had no love for as well. I mean, of and also course, that, and very importantly, that Khatami was making aggressive and very serious efforts to reconcile with the United States, yeah, which I were mean, completely destroyed by, in fact, uh, you know, another sort of mega scumbag, David Frum, with his, you know, ludicrous axis of evil stuff. So this stuff still flows through to today. And obviously the Trump administration has been relentlessly belligerent and murderous with Iran. And uh, it's, and it's yeah. pretty perverse that Frum is being rehabilitated by, you know, uh, many people. On, I mean, even though, even if his critiques are relevant, find someone better to make those critiques after what And they're not. They're just it, standard issue. Trump is a baddie stuff. Uh, he's, but he's, it's, he's nothing. It's, yeah. Utterly sort of unforgivable that he's still taken seriously, especially about his involvement. I mean, if we look at the Iranian regime, when it comes to internal affairs, you know, the difference between reformists and hardliners is perhaps less than when it comes to foreign affairs, where I believe the primary division in Iran between reformists and, and hardliners is whether or not to pursue a detente with the United States. And that's a significant thing. And I think sort of a less hyper sort of tense um, a political uh, relationship between the United States and Iran will benefit the Iranians because it will give that breathing space for Iranians to be able to critique their regime more uh, fully and for uh, opposition movements not to immediately get labeled uh, as uh, stooges of imperialism. Iran has, and we've discussed this before, a long history of foreign intervention. I mean, when people criticized Obama for not you know, going out overtly supporting the Green Movement, he was doing the right thing in many ways because the kiss of death would have been the United States openly embracing this movement and allowing its opponents to uh, you know, portray it as a foreign plot because this is a common trope in Iranian politics. So, you know, well, and also, yeah, and, and, and just to, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's also, yeah, important to note that there are, um, there are these ongoing activities uh, from the United States that undermine organic movements uh, across the board in Iran, including some elements of the Green Movement. And let's be honest, I mean, in the United States, we have people from Democratic and Republican sides uh, still doing work and, you know, often in some cases getting paid very well for the MEK, which is this political terrorist, you know, or, or they were officially, they used to be a terrorist organization. They were, they were pulled off of it because of a aggressive lobbying effort that implicated everybody from, you know, uh, Rudy Giuliani to Howard Dean. Uh, so, you know, it, yes. And, and it can do nothing but hurt those who either want the current system to maintain but want serious changes or want to overthrow the whole thing and replace it with something different. Uh, and, and, you know, yeah. Exactly. Things like the MEK and the, the Shahist opposition, there's big money for American politicians to get involved in that. You know, many of the Shahists, you know, looted the country in 1979 so they can pay people big checks. So, you know, there's a, there's a, pure financial interest in pursuing some of this hostility to Iran. Just look at the paychecks people like Giuliani and Bolton have received uh, from, from these uh, opposition groups. And believe you me, you know, one thing that would make Iran a lot worse is a group like the uh, Mujahideen Khalq coming into power. That would be perhaps the main step backwards that could take place in that country.